Good morning. Come on now, there's more than three or four in the way. Good morning. It is good to see each and every one of you. We pray that everyone will be blessed to be in God's house this morning. Would you rather be in jail? Anyone? Okay, at least there's laughs. So I appreciate that. So hopefully God will bless our services. And so this time, let's go ahead and pray and ask Him to do so. Father in heaven, as we come before you now, Lord, we love you. Father, we praise you for who you are. You are the creator of this universe. Father, you are our Savior and friend. Lord, I pray that we would be blessed by being here today. Father, that whether it's through our fellowship, Father, as we lift up our voices in praise and worship to your name, Father, as we spend time in your word, I ask you to bless it all so that we might glorify you. We ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right, this time, would you join me as we say our memory verse for the month of August all together? 1 Timothy 4.12 Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. 1 Timothy 4.12 We all stand with me now as we worship our great God.
Uh, so if you're a WANA leader interested or interested in maybe getting involved in WANA, uh, we do have um, a potential meeting you can register for. Uh, that'll be starting at 7 um, and going to, I believe it's 8 or 8.30 and we'll get you out of here. But uh, it'll be an opportunity for us um, who are involved in that street to meet with other people in WANA clubs, other leaders, uh, and kind of talk about um, this upcoming WANA uh, year. So if you make yourself available to that, that would be great. If you want to know how to get registered, see me afterwards. The QR code you can um, scan, and that will get you right to our registration. So, um, next Sunday, Judy Bowen is going to be here. So we've been kind of waiting on that. She's our missionary of the month. So uh, with that being said, uh, we do have the missionary of the month board back there with pictures uh, of a much younger me as well. <laughs> I was reminded um, I can't do things like I used to on my birthday. Uh, kickball did not go so well. So I have a new accessory. Just wanted to fit in with some other boot people. So. Um, and then as well, uh, down there is a, a notice. Secret Sisters uh, is getting ready to start up again. So if you're interested in joining that, um, pick up, I believe there is a, a sheet or a form on the back table. And try to get those returned by September 3rd if you're planning on that. Um, Really, I think that's all I have for updates. Uh, the rest of the Sunday night summer small groups is uh, mentioned there. Um, I just want to say I had a, a great time this summer in the small groups. So if you guys can make yourselves available next year, uh, I think it would be a great blessing. It was a, a fun time in fellowship at the different locations. And food and snacks are always good as well. So um, is there any prayer updates or concerns we need to mention? Toward the left. 
Even when the fool walks along the road, his sense is lacking, and he demonstrates to everyone that he is a fool. If the ruler's temper rises against you, do not abandon your position, because composure allays great offenses. There is an evil I have seen under the sun, like an arrow which goes forth from the ruler. Folly is set in many exalted places, while rich men sit in humble places. I have seen slaves riding on horses, and princes walking like slaves on the land. He who digs a pit may fall into it, and a serpent may bite him who breaks through a wall. He who quarries stones may be hurt by them, and he who splits logs may be endangered by them. If the axe is dull, and he does not sharpen his edge, then he must exert more strength. Wisdom has the advantage of giving success. If the serpent bites before being charmed, there is no profit for the charmer. Words from the mouth of a wise man are gracious, while the lips of a fool consume him. The beginning of his talking is folly, and the end of it is wicked madness. Yet the fool multiplies words. No man knows what will happen, and who can tell him what will come after him? The toil of a fool so wearies him that he does not even know how to go to a city. Woe to you, O land, whose king is a lad and whose princes feast in the morning. Blessed are you, O land, whose king is of nobility and whose princes eat at their appropriate time for strength and not for drunkenness. Through indolence the rafters sag, and through slackness the house leaks. Men prepare a meal for enjoyment, and wine makes life merry, and money is the answer to everything. Furthermore, in your bedchamber do not curse a king, and in your sleeping rooms do not curse a rich man, for a bird of the heavens will carry the sound, and the winged creature will make the matter known. Again, over and over in Ecclesiastes we're reminded the world's way and man's way of doing things is foolish. We are to seek to do things God's way. Amen? Do, does the word of the Lord, are they to be something we seek and cherish? Yes or no? Yes. All right. Well, you just said so by your own mouth, so now as we stand, let's continue singing. Speak, O Lord.
Look at the ships also. Although they are so great and are driven by strong winds, are still directed by a very small rudder wherever the inclination of the pilot desires. So also the tongue is a small part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things. See how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, the very world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life and is set on fire by hell. For every species of beasts and birds, of reptiles and creatures of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by the human race, but no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come both blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be this way. Does a fountain send, for, send out from the same opening both fresh and bitter water? Can a fig tree, my brethren, produce olives, or a vine produce figs? Nor can salt water produce fresh. We know those verses fairly well, but I want you to consider the different types of power that Scripture teaches us there that are in our words. The first one, you know, we get three different pairs. First off, James talks about a bridle and a rudder. Now, I'm no expert on horses, so if I'm saying something maybe not completely correct, you can correct me later, but a bridle is a metal piece inserted to a horse's mouth. Now, I've watched as it was being inserted, and I got a kick out of it because the horse that they were putting the bridle in its mouth, its tongue started going crazy because it didn't like this thing being put into its mouth. And yet, a small piece of metal attached to the reins can control what is truly a very strong and powerful animal. Unfortunately, I've never had the chance to go horse riding because growing up in Chicago, it's not like there was lots of horses around in the city. <laughs> Occasionally, we saw a police officer around them, you know, at certain events, but didn't get to ride when I was finally old enough and had opportunity. I'm not a small guy. And wouldn't you know at some of the places we went to, they didn't have horses that could accommodate someone my size. And so I've never sought it out. But from what I've observed, horses are very beautiful animals, but very, very powerful. And to think that a small piece of metal can be used to control such a strong animal. But the second example that James gives us is a rudder. Now, if you ever look at older ships and you see the size of the rudder, it's very small in comparison. Now, one of the rudders that I want to describe to you is actually wasn't very small in comparison to my size. But in comparison to the ship it went to, it was tiny. When I was in Pensacola, I had the opportunity to go see an aircraft here. And it was one that was decommissioned. And for those who've ever seen one, or those maybe who've ever had the privilege to be on one, they're literally floating cities. Now this was a much older one, but I remember sitting and getting out of the car and just looking at this massive ship. And to think something that large could be controlled by relatively, in comparison, a very small piece of metal that when the pilot of the ship, the captain, turns the wheel, it adjusts that and can cause even the greatest of ships to change course and direction. The illustration that James is using there is to indicate our words have the power to direct things, even things that are much larger and stronger than our control. But then he talks about fire and poison. To any who may have had the unfortunate situation of enduring a house fire, it's incredible how just the smallest sparks can cause something extremely disastrous. And I remember, most of you have probably seen out here um, the house that's kind of like right on the corner, this little side street that goes outside the credit union. They're attached kind of garage and maybe second building there caught on fire a couple years ago. In fact, <laughs> I remember Missy and I were in the office that day when it was, when it happened and it was just incredible. The smoke and the fire and, and we didn't actually come to meet kind of through a connection, someone who was supposed to be living in that building. In fact, that, that fire took place right after a family moved in. But that all being said, fire can be very destructive. 
You know, it, it actually made me a little cautious this week because for those who live here in town, you've seen all the con construction workers that have been running the orange, orange cables, and I'm pretty sure they're working with a new internet company that's going through. Well, Tuesday, Tuesdays is usually the one day I'm here at the church most of the day, and it's my main study day. And sometimes I stop around 12 to go to lunch. Sometimes if I'm working through, I take later lunch as well. I had gone home about 1 o'clock, so about close to 2, I'm starting to head back to the church. And the construction workers were out by this corner out here, but there were fire trucks when I came back. Like, what in the world? I'm looking for an accident. Well, my windows were rolled down. As soon as I got up close, they must have hit a gas line. Got me thinking, Lord, please don't allow no little sparks. It's close enough to church. I would hate to see the damage that might cause. But fire is a destructive thing. Poison. You know, if you've ever seen videos that, you know, or maybe you've even seen them live in person, different varieties of snakes. And yet some snakes in this world are so deadly that the poison can kill you so rapidly. Our words do have the power to direct, but James tells us our, our words also have the power to destroy and bring destruction. Words, we must be careful. And yet, then the last illustration he gives, he's talking about fountains and, and even trees and vines. Now, the reference there is, you know, when you dig down, open up a fountain, I'm sure your anticipation is not that you're going to have both, you know, depending on what time of the day is, you can get fresh water in the morning, but in the evening or at a certain time, you're only going to get bitter water. No. When you dig a well like that, you anticipate to have fresh water all the time. If it's bitter, you're not going to go back every hour and just hope, oh, maybe it's fresh. Oh, no, it's bitter, then something's wrong with the water in there and the well that you dug. It's not supposed to come back out. And what James is saying there is, folks, good words and bad words are not supposed to be coming out of the same mouth. That's not the way it should be with us. Furthermore, the, the reference to the vines and the figs and the trees, as you can the olives and the figs don't grow on the opposite things. Now that we're saved, there ought to be identity. But yet, what does the fruit and what does water produce? Our words can either produce dismay or delight. If our words are bringing forth like that fresh water or the right type of fruit, it can be a great delight. If it brings Sorry, I, I joke about it every once in a while, but no, sometimes here in Glasgow, we have the benefit of having extra iron in our water because from time to time it gets a little rusty. Not the kind I encourage people to drink. But the point is, I guarantee you, I don't think there's anybody even in this town that doesn't want or wish that it would be fresh all the time and have no problems. Folks, for us as believers, if we've been saved, we have the Holy Spirit living within us, what type of words should be coming out? We think we must not forget. Now last week, we started talking about this kind of last aspect as we close the Colossians of the new man. And Paul is now addressing our communication. We need to have the right words. And so last week in verse uh, 2 and even the first part of verse 3 here, we talked about prayer. Prayer ought to be one of the priorities of communication that comes from our mouth that we are giving to God. Our communication to God ought to be more important than our communication to anyone else. Now that doesn't mean that anyone else isn't important, but He is to be number one and how we talk to Him and different aspects of our prayer are things that we need to be mindful of all the time. This week, we're going to move on to proclaiming, proclamation, if you will. And this is our communication that is directed to others. Proclaiming is speech that's directed at others. You know, how we communicate with other people, it reveals a lot about us. Specifically, even, our faith and relationship with the Lord. Have you ever had someone, either referring to you or maybe referring to someone else, come up and say, you know, I can tell you or I can tell they're a believer just by the way they're talking. That's the power of God in our words, folks. You know, on the other hand, 
Why are there occasions that would normally draw the attention of many, whether it's a great deal or a great sale, or maybe even some unbelievable opportunity, why do things like that go unnoticed or unattended? Number one reason? Nobody got the word out. <laughs> if there's a great sale and you tell me about it, but it ended yesterday, well, that doesn't do me much good now, does it? No, in fact, I got an email yesterday. For those who don't know, I do know that occasionally. I do like hot sauce as well. There's a certain hot sauce chain store around the country. And unfortunately, there's no one near here, close to one South Bend. But they said, oh, today, yesterday, and today is free shipping. Problem is, problem is, I don't really have the money for those hot sauces right now. And if I buy them, unfortunately, my two older boys make them disappear before I even get to try anything. But yet, if I know someone, you know, I was telling my brother about it. Well, that sale doesn't do him any good if I don't tell him about it and he doesn't know about it, does it? You know, I was thinking, there was a incident, I believe, I think Walt and Beth were telling me about it. It was like last year, I think you guys, I think the Beatles were at the same one. There was a Gaither concert at the Coliseum and something happened where I think he told me that Shelby had called and said that I guess there was a lot of unsold tickets close to showtime and so they were able to get them dirt cheap. Well, I found out about that after the concert, and I was like, man, I wish I had known, because I would have made time to go down there for it. Why? Because if they're selling them cheaper and it's something that I would have loved to go on to, that would have been great. But they didn't know about it at the time. Now, I bring that all up for this purpose, folks. We have a responsibility to be proclaimed. What did Paul say to the Romans? How then will they call on him? And he's referring to people who aren't saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? Come on now. One of the greatest forms of communication we can ever have with other people is telling them about the wonderful saving grace of Jesus Christ. Amen? So why don't more people know about it? And I'm not accusing and saying that you don't ever tell, but folks, that's something that needs to be regular, habitual, constant in our lives, telling people about the Lord who saved us, the one whom we claim to serve and walk with daily. You know, Paul wasn't saying, and, and I want you to notice this, you know, we, we love the first few questions, but then some people have taken the wrong interpretation of this verse, and that last question says, and how will they hear without a preacher? It's not the pastor's job to be the only one telling people about the Lord or, or leading them to the Christ. Amen. That phrase, without a preacher, is not referring to a pastor position. It's referring to without someone to proclaim the message. We all have that responsibility as God's children to tell others about the one who changed our life. Or at least that's what we do. There should never be a diminishing excitement about what Jesus Christ has done for us. Now come back to Colossians chapter 4 with me. Colossians chapter 4, we're going to look at the first part of this verse. Paul writes, praying at the same time for us as well. And I'm going to stop with that first part of it. Praying at the same time for us as well. Now, at the same time. What does that mean? Well, this isn't a hard one, folks. <laughs> it means while you're praying to God, praying to Him about things going on in your life, pray for us as well. We are to be spiritual multitaskers continually. And when prayer is your only avenue to help others, it is not by any means the least you can do. It's the most you can do. And it ought to be the first thing that we do. Amen? Don't ever, ever let someone try to say that prayer is not popular. You're talking to the wrong guy if you want to use that argument with me. Because I've seen how powerful it is in too many cases. And I know most, if not all of you, have as well. And we were mentioning it last week. But we can start listening. We can just go through probably row by row by row and start mentioning things that we've prayed for and ask God to work with or deal with in specific circumstances. And then we can also, by God's grace, praise Him for how He's answered. Amen? Prayer is powerful. Now, there are 
too common, but there really should be three types of prayer requests that we typically pray for. The first one is praying for needs. Now most of you probably know this verse well, but James 5.16 says, Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. And then the last part of that verse, I, I love that phrase. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Hmm. We pray often, I hope, for the needs of others. And you know what? The prayers of one who is righteous are effective and they accomplish much. And that's why James started off, therefore confess your sins to one another. I want to make sure that I have that open communication with God so that when I pray to Him, He hears. And if I'm walking with Him and delighting in Him, He's anxious to answer those prayers according to His will. Second type of praying is praying for wants and desires. And we mentioned this verse this morning in Sunday school, but Psalm 37, 4, I love this verse. Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. Now, folks, I haven't mentioned it in a while. So for those of you who haven't heard me say this before, we're going to give the crash course in Greek. Does anybody know what the word will or the word shall means in Scripture? What kind of words are they, folks? Come on, say it louder. Promise words. The word will, the word shall in the English language are helping verbs. But in the Greek, when God puts them in Scripture, they're His promises, and He's never broken one. So taking that into consideration, delight yourself in the Lord. Make Him the delight of your life. Whatever His will may dictate, I'm going to delight in it because I love you, Lord. And what does He say then? I will give you the desires of your heart. But see, at that point, it's not, okay, so i got to put on a happy Jesus face so that way I can get what I want. No, that's not what that verse is saying. What it's saying is when you're truly delighting in Him, whatever His will is in a situation, you can guarantee He will deliver. But see, that's the thing. If our delight's in Him, then the things that might currently be the desires of our heart. But I go to you, Lord, and I say, Lord, I want you to be the joy. So if this thing that I'm wanting is going to affect my relationship with you. You know it, so Lord, then don't give it to me. But Lord, I want to delight in you. So that way when I ask him for things, if I'm walking with him and I'm delighting in him, he can't wait to give us those things. I had the privilege of going out with my son yesterday. Unfortunately, his birthday falls on Thursday, and <laughs> Thursday just happens to be a very busy day for our family in so many respects. Thursday, the kids got school. He's got football practice afterwards. And then it's back to school night for them at Blackhawk. And so him and Titus, after they get done with football practice, are going to have to find some place to sit and do their homework. I'm going to graciously get Josh and Lydia bring them home. So that way they don't annoy my wife too much. Not that they'd ever do that. But. It's also our Awana night here. So I know it's like a big kid. We're not going to be able to do too much for you on your birthday. But I said, let's go out. So we got out. And went and got him something that he wanted for his birthday. Took him out, we had lunch, and spent some time. Cherish those moments. Believe me. I'm thrilled and happy when I can, as a parent, do good things for my kids. But if I, a sinner, can love on my kids that much, how much more can our Heavenly Father love on us? Praying for one's desires. Nothing wrong with that. But then... As I come to this third type of request, and the one that should be included along with praying for needs and praying for wants and desires, I need to condition this third type of request. I hope that this is one that is found in our church. But I'm going to tell you right now, this third type of request, when it is found in churches that are truly strong in the Lord, you see churches that are growing and being used by God in a great and mighty way. And not because they're mega churches or because of the size, but because of what God is doing through them. Before I reveal it, I have to ask a question. And I expect a hearty but honest answer to this. Okay? 
Do you want our church to be filled, brimming over the top with God's power, making us strong in his might and effective for his glory and honor? Yes or no? Okay? Then we must pray for opportunities. Specifically, opportunities to pray, claim truth. I have, I didn't do it during the message time and the announcement time, but I need to present something to each and every one of you. The deacons and I met yesterday and a few weeks ago, we had a visitor come to our church. And he was here because he's the representative of something called LifeWise Academy. Now, LifeWise Academy, we are going to be presenting to this church, and I'm going to be bringing it in more details in the coming weeks. And we're actually going to have, um, his name is Ben, he's going to come back and actually do a presentation, like a missionary presentation. But what LifeWise is, is it's a program that started in Northwest Ohio, and it has grown rapidly. For those, maybe who go to school in Columbia City, I believe he told us that Columbia City was actually the first town in Northeast Indiana where it started. Garrett has had it running for a while. Central Noble up in Albion, they're starting it this year. But what it is, is a program where we have to get approval from the community. We then need the support of some of our local churches. But we come together and once the school board gives us the approval, it's basically a program where we bus kids over to a local church for 45 minutes a week. For a Bible class. Now, folks, I believe we live in a community that not only would support it, I believe it's something that several of the churches would agree. Giving our kids in our public school an opportunity to have a Bible lesson once a week, something that may be even somewhat similar to like our Awana program during the school day. I mean, it's actually where they would be bused from the school, brought over, say, to here to our church, and for 45 minutes through the curriculum that LifeWise had, we would have a Bible class with. Who's to say that the Lord won't give us the opportunity to have that program and there'll be some boys and girls that come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior and also some boys and girls who get to know and learn more about who our great God is. That's an opportunity. And like I said, I'm just giving just a little brief summary of it here right now. But folks, that's something that I'm going to ask you to right now even pray for. I believe this is something that, well, it's something that Another church here in town had started to move on, and unfortunately some things have changed, and it's presented us with an opportunity to run with them. Folks, an opportunity to reach boys and girls for Jesus Christ and then to see them grow and know more and more about who our great God is, how could we not seek an endeavor like that? Amen? And so I'm asking you even now, we're not making any decisions today, I'm just asking you to pray that God will grant this opportunity for his glory. But folks, that's just one small example of opportunities that we're to be praying for. When Paul said, pray at the same time for us as well, that God will open up to us a door for the word. Now, whether it's life-wise, that's just one example. How about our water program? Folks, are you praying right now that God will give us a good year for our water program? If you're not, don't you dare come and complain once. Well, our water problems, our water program is shrinking, so do we really need to have it? I hope I would never hear those words, but folks, if we want to see a water do well, we need to either find ways to go out and be inviting boys and girls to come to it, but we also at the same time need to be praying. Amen? Amen. Let's pray that God will give us a wonderful year in our water program, so just like even this LifeWise opportunity, we'll continue to reach boys and girls for Jesus Christ. But that's not all. We can talk about our VBS. We can talk about outreach opportunities like we had during Turtle Days, as well as several of our ministries, our men's and ladies' Bible studies, our youth program. How about Golden Group? I tend to believe, I'm pretty convinced, there have already been many somebodies who've been humbly praying to see that opportunity grow. And guess what? That ministry has been growing and thriving. And you'll be hard-pressed to convince me otherwise that there haven't been people praying that it will grow and that God, God will use it. Folks, that needs to be true about every opportunity that we could possibly dream of to accomplish and share the Word of God with anyone. We all need to be praying fervently for all those areas and more. Not so that we can pray about our church, oh, look at all the things our church. No, 
but to brag about how great our God is and look at what he allows us and gives us the privilege to do for his glory and honor. In praying for opportunities, we must remember that Christ honoring and glorifying prayers are for seeking God's will to be done, not ours. You want to know the simple three-part blueprint to knowing God's will for your life? It's pretty easy. And it has nothing to do with knowing what job you're going to have or what tomorrow holds. Knowing God's will for your life comes down to three things. One, reading your Bible every day. Praying every day. Those are indicative of our, of our relationship with the Father. But the third part is telling people. Telling others about who God is. Proclaiming to others that Jesus saved you and that you have a personal relationship with him. Folks, that message should never, ever get old. Now, you remember the verse that we put up just a few moments ago from Romans. How will they hear unless somebody tells them? You are to tell the world so that they might hear. I wonder what or why you either drop the ball or may even be unwilling to share. Romans 1.16, Paul says, For I am not ashamed. I am not ashamed of the gospel. Why? It's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. To the Jew first and also the Greek, but it's for everyone. It's an incredible thing. Why would I ever have a reason not to share? But I guarantee you, every single one of us, myself included, the devil's constantly whispering the excuses are, no, 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 they don't look like somebody who wants to hear that. No, 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 you, you just know that they're going to tell you no, so why even bother? We can get excuses whispered into our ear all day long, but there's never one that we should act upon. Say, oh, I, I, I just, somebody else will tell them. Are you ashamed of the gospel or not? If there has been a failure to proclaim, it's usually boils down to be the result of shame. I'm sorry, if there's been a failure to proclaim, it's a result of either shame or it's laziness. If either of those have described you, change. You don't have to keep going in that direction. You don't have to keep living with regret that ah, I should have told that person. Well, fine. The next person that Jesus brings across your door, share it with them. If anything, if you know some of those individuals who maybe you've dropped the ball and failed the opportunity, go find them. Share with them who Jesus Christ is. Now, if those are things that you have been doing, then by God, keep on proclaiming for his glory and for his honor. Coming back to Colossians 4, three, remember, just like we said last week, we're to pray with purpose, we're to pray specifically. Why? So that God will open up to us a door for the word. Essentially what we should be praying is, God, please give me an opportunity today to share with someone who you are. And you know what? As much as we ought to be looking for the evangelistic opportunity to share the gospel, we ought to also be looking for opportunities to find my brother or my sister, whoever it may be, and share with them just how good God is, maybe something that the Lord's blessing you and your walk with him. Guess what? It may end up being just as much of a blessing to them as it is to you. We ought to be edifying, encouraging one another. I'll say this though. If you don't feel like God gives you many opportunities, and I hate to break it to you, but you're either not asking or you're not asking the right way. There's a way to fix that. If you got your Bibles, go with me to Matthew chapter 7. Perhaps some of you already know the reference I'm going to, but in Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 through 11. If you don't feel like God's giving you opportunity to share the word, then here's what you should do. Verse 7 says, Ask. I could stop right there, and that would be enough. But Jesus goes even further. He says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek. Don't just ask. You know, that's something too. I'm sharing with this with somebody. My, my dad. love my dad. And every once in a while, he can have some pet peeves. And sometimes I think, oh, Dad, you're just being, you know, that's, that's kind of nonsense. Or maybe you're just going overboard. And sometimes I look back and say, 
You know what? That makes a lot of sense. Actually, I learned something this week. You know what? The one of the best um, cleaning agents that you can use for poison ivy or poison sumac? Carburetor cleaner. When somebody when somebody first said that, I'm like, and then after thinking about it and explaining, I was like, you know what? That actually makes a lot of sense. <laughs> Long story short, ask God. And the pet peeve that my dad had is, so many times people pray and say, Lord, bring us people. Sometimes we've prayed here in our church, Lord, please bring us lots of boys for, for a one, or please bring us lots of boys and girls for, for VBS. And there's nothing wrong with praying that prayer. But folks, if we're not going out and seeking them as well, shame on them. By all means, let's ask God to bring us some. And you know what? There are times He brings people into our lives and we have no clue where they came from. But we ought to also be going out and seeking them as well. Ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you will find. And then lastly, knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And he who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. Or what man is there among you who when his son asks for a loaf will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, he will not give him a snake, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask him? And everything, therefore, treat people the same way you want them to treat you, for this is the law and the prophets. Say, Pastor Joe, I don't know that God's given me any opportunities. Have you asked? Have you done the seeking? Have you been knocking down those doors? His will is greater than our needs. Those are the answers both. As much as he wants to answer the requests, the, the desires, the needs of others, of ourselves, he wants to give us opportunities to be used for his glory. So why are these doors and opportunities not being opened? Is it because of God's ability? Hmm, nope. Is it because we're not faithfully requesting? Well, what is the thing that prevents us from faithfully requesting those opportunities? If you got your Bibles, go to James chapter 4. Sin is the reason that prayers aren't answered. But sin is also the reason that the prayers don't even get spoken in the first place. Because if we're off living in sin... We're not talking to him. And if we've got sin unconfessed in our life, he's not hearing those prayers. James chapter 4. I'm supposed to turn on my toy, you guys, to keep for that. James chapter 4. I want to read verses 1 through 10. What is the source of quarrels? and conflicts among you. Is not the source of your pleasures that wage war in your members? You lust and do not have, so you commit murder. You're envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, so that you may spend it on your pleasures. You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture speaks to no purpose? He jealously desires the spirit which he has made to dwell in us. But he gives a greater grace. Therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord and He will exalt you. Like I said, sin is the reason why prayers aren't answered. It's the reason why those prayers never get spoken. Because we are not to be friends of the world. We're to be ambassadors to the world. John 15, 15. No longer do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends, 
For all things that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. Guess what he's making known to us? I want you to go tell people about me. I also love the, the aspect in this verse that even though we are slaves, we're either slaves to sin or we're slaves to righteousness. Being a slave to righteousness means I've received Christ's righteousness when he saved my soul. But what, Paul, or what Jesus is saying here is, I don't call you slaves. I don't look at you as my property. I just go around. I call you friends because I love you. My love for you is the very reason I died for you. How friendly are we with the world? And how friendly are we with the Lord? See, ambassadors convey messages. What Paul says here is we are conveying that so that we speak forth the mystery of Christ for which I have also been in prison, that I may make it clear in the way I ought to speak. See, the thing is, you can't explain the mystery of Christ if you haven't solved that one for yourself. And if you haven't solved the mystery of Christ, then I pray you don't leave this building without figuring it out. You know what the mystery of Christ is? We're all sinners. In need of a Savior. God's gift of salvation is available. But if you never receive it, then you still haven't solved the great mystery. But that's the solving that we're to go out there proclaiming so that people will understand there is a Savior who loves them and died for them. You have to fully understand the message in order to communicate it. You have to know and understand that it may cost you Proclaim. Paul ended up in prison for proclaiming. Proclaiming will have a cost, but I also want to make sure that when I have to go out and explain it, as he says in verse 4, so that I may make it clear in the way I ought to speak. I want to share God's word so that when people hear it, those who are not going to oppose it will hear it and say, I want that. I want that peace. I want that hope. How can I have that joy in my life? Where we then follow up and respond to the show. Let me tell you who Jesus is. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed. The number one question we have to ask right now are we willing? Are we willing to proclaim God's truth? to study it, to know it, at any cost, not being ashamed. We're going to sing the closing hymn in just a moment. For some, it's probably a familiar song, but perhaps you may not be as familiar with the verse, because we're not singing the first one on this one. But it's, take my life and let it be known. Folks, I think you would all gladly agree with me that we want to see God use our church. We want God to continue to give us those opportunities to proclaim that word to other people. I'm begging you, please, please pray with me that God will give us this opportunity with life wise. Please pray with me that God will give us an incredible year in our water program that there might be some boys and girls who come to know Jesus as their Savior this year. Pray that God will lay it on hearts to come and serve, to be a lot of teachers and workers. We need those as well. Pray for the opportunities. Don't let anything stand in our way. Father, as we come before you this morning, I pray. Lord, first and foremost, help us to understand the great importance of proclaiming your truth. Father, I pray that for anyone that might be here today, Lord, if there is unconfessed sin that is blocking that prayer, Lord, I pray that today we would settle it. We would come in confession and repentance, seeking your face for forgiveness. Then receiving the restored joy of your fellowship so that we might then ask you, Lord, to give us opportunities to accomplish your will. 
God, I pray for this upcoming year. Lord, I thank you so much for the many teachers we have. Lord, the opportunity that we already have in so many facets to have an impact on the young lives for Christ. God, I pray from our kids to our seniors. Lord, I pray for this the remainder of this year and even in the coming year. And for every year to follow till we're looking you in the face, Lord, that we would follow, faithfully proclaim your truth. That we would tell others, Lord, that there would never be a moment we'd be ashamed to tell. Father, that we would be on guard so that sin never blocks those requests. And then use us according to your perfect will for your glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me as we sing the closing hymn?
Father in heaven, as we come before you today, we love you. Father, we thank you for who you are. Lord, thank you for giving us a message to proclaim. Lord, that not only we're recipients of that great gift, but Father, you get to, we get to be used by you to share that gift with so many. Father, may we faithfully do so. We ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Again, if you want to keep writing, you take your time. But if you want you to fill out your cards, give them to one of my boys. They can put them in that offering plate they're holding. And if you have any unused cards, please put them back on the sound desk because we're going to, we'll reuse them in the future if they haven't been written. So, thank you all. I hope you have a wonderful week. God bless. Thank you.